Welcome back to Digit Debates. I am absolutely thrilled to have Jonathan here today to talk about their new book, Restarting the Future. Um, Jonathan's a previous book with a Stein on capitalism without capital was actually quite important in influencing the way we wrote up the proposal to have the Digit Centre, trying to understand what the role of the growth of intangible uh, industries were and their consequences. And I think that previous book was really important in identifying a couple of concepts to try and help us understand the effects of scalable technologies, uh, the role of spillovers and the effect of sunk costs on investment, some of which comes up in his new book, and the role of synergies between these different types of technology. So we found the book absolutely great to read, very, very readable, very erudite. And so it was a great pleasure when the new book came out to see what the challenges of restarting the future are. So I'm very pleased to welcome Jonathan, who is Professor of Economics at Imperial and external member of the uh, Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. So with no further ado, Jonathan, I'd like to hand over to you. Jonathan will give a short presentation about half an hour or so. And after that, we'll have Q&A. You can put questions in the chat in between if you want, and we'll pick them all up at the end. So thank you very much for coming, Jonathan. Uh, Jackie, thank you very much indeed. I'm sharing my screen at the moment, so I hope everybody can see some slides. So thank you uh, for the thumbs up. Um, look, it's an absolute pleasure. I, I, I apologise uh, that I'm not with you in person in Sussex, um, <clears throat> but uh, I've just got a very busy schedule at the moment. Um, but it's a pleasure to be able to talk about uh, my new book uh, with, with Stian Westlake uh, called Restarting the Future, uh, which is, should be up on the screen uh, now. As Jackie kindly said, um, I also have a second job, which is working at the Bank of England. Um, I have nothing to say today about monetary policy. That would be for another day, uh, because uh, there's quite enough to be talked about, uh, about the very important issue about how to fix the intangible economies. So let me just leap straight into uh, telling you uh, what our book um, is about. And I'm going to try advancing the slides and hopefully this will work. Um, let me click the right button there. That slide should have gone on. I hope uh, you can see the new slide. Um, thanks for the thumbs up. Our, our book then starts uh, with the sort of notion that there seems to be, at least in many people's minds, a big economic disappointment at the moment. The 21st century economy has let us down in various ways. And, and, and what are those ways? Um, I'm afraid it's a litany of difficulties that uh, people in society um, are facing. Uh, uh, stagnation is an obvious economics focused uh, um, uh, uh, difficulty, um, particularly low productivity growth, inequality, dysfunctional competition, and then perhaps two things which are slightly less economics -y. I'm an economist, I should say, and I know the research center spans many, many disciplines. Um, so I hope this will be of interest to many other disciplines, but um, economics has got rather less to say about some issues about fragility and inauthenticity. Um, let me say a few words about that. Um, stagnation here, uh, again, kind of an economics focus, this, that economic growth, basically the growth of GDP, GDP per capita has slowed down everywhere <clears throat> dramatically uh, since the early uh, 2000s. Now, of course, there are a whole series of questions about whether growth is a good or a bad thing. Um, but let us let me be an economist for a moment <clears throat> and tell you that I think it's a good thing. And therefore, the slowdown in growth, other things equal, um, is not so good. We can take that up in the Q&A. Um, what about inequality? Um, as people will know, um, there's been um, a, a tremendous uh, a change in the economic fortunes of the rich and the poor uh, over the last, well, so at least over the last 20 years, excuse me, <clears throat> with rising prosperity for the richer, uh, rising prosperity for poor people in emerging countries, that's on the left-hand side of the slide here, um, the rich people on the right-hand side of the slide here, which I'm trying to point with, with the mouse, I hope you can see that, um, and people squeezed uh, in the middle. Um, Dysfunctional competition is an issue much discussed um, by um, economists. Uh, and up on the top right, I have a picture here um, of the service sector. Uh, and this is some work done by the OED. If you take the top firms in the service sector, you get company accounts data, you can look at thousands of firms across all of Europe and ask, how are they doing? How is their growth going? 
uh, as against <clears throat> the laggard firms, what you find is that the frontier firms, that's the blue line there, have been breaking away from the laggard firms. And a view is then taken um, that something is going wrong with the process of competition, because often in competition, one of the roles of competition is that the frontier firms get knocked off the frontier um, by competitive uh, 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 laggard firms who then become the frontier firms who then get knocked off again and so on. Something seems to be going wrong with that kind of process. And that's given rise to a lot of discussion about how competition policy isn't doing the right thing. That's again, a very economics -y kind of approach. Let me take a more kind of work studies, management studies kind of approach. If you ask people about their working lives, Many people in their working lives um, say, um, actually, there's uh, there's in incredibly intense competition. There's none of the you know frontier pulling away uh, from the laggards and no competition at all. It's very intense competition, monitoring of people, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, allegedly uh, in in a bad way uh, in um, lots of technology companies. Um, and then there's uh, Daniel Markovitz's book on the on the meritocracy trap trap uh, talking about um, the kind of ruinous competition there is to get one's children into the best schools and the best universities and so forth. So competition appears to have taken a bit of a peculiar turn. Fragility, again, a slightly less economics-y uh, subject. It does seem uh, in the modern world that these existential threats, climate change, uh, obviously with the COP uh, uh, conference going on at the moment, that's a key issue, and COVID, uh, these kind of challenges seem to um, abound. And finally, uh, inauthenticity. Uh, the late David Graeber um, has got a, a terrific job, excuse my language, called Bullshit Jobs, a, a terrific book uh, 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 called Bullshit Jobs, um, arguing that one of the difficulties of the modern world is that many people are doing, as it says on the slide there, um, they're doing kind of fake and unreal kind of. Uh, and for those of you <coughs> who, uh, who like uh, watching, um, watching the TV, uh, Call My Agent seems to be a situation uh, in which everybody is kind of scurrying around uh, and they're attempting to make deals with everybody else but nobody seems to be doing something none of these people are actors they're all talent agents i should say in case you haven't seen the program none of them are actually actors none of them are actually you know writing some software programs to actually um uh, uh, to actually make a movie uh, or building a new set or something or holding a camera or something like that. Um, they're all just doing uh, shuffling bits of paper uh, in an attempt to recruit different people. Um, so those are the sort of uh, uh, difficulties um, that people seem to suggest um, the economy is under. Now, there are two common ways to understand this. Uh, it seemed to us in the literature, we're going to propose a third way, but let me start with the two common ways. Bad conduct on the left and unlucky circumstances uh, on the right. What's the bad conduct? Well, something about society has lost its way. Maybe there's too much neoliberalism. Maybe there's too little neoliberalism, not enough risk taking, not enough dynamism, not enough commitment to the future. Um, or it might be unlucky circumstances. Maybe technology has just slowed down. Uh, we've run out of ideas. Uh, we had a whole series of wonderful ideas in the Industrial Revolution uh, and in the Information Technology Revolution, but perhaps that's all over now. Uh, and the only thing we've got left is, you know, sending messages on Twitter uh, or posing you know, posing cat video, posting cat videos on Instagram, uh, maybe, uh, and that slowdown is maybe just an inevitable consequence of the society getting richer. Uh, we've got perfectly, we've got not perfectly rich, we've got uh, relatively in historical st standards, astoundingly rich in the West, maybe we just don't need any more goods. Uh, and so the slowdown is nothing uh, to be concerned about. Uh, we say, that actually that's not the right explanation. We say what's really going on is the economy has changed. How has the economy changed? Here are the top, there's about top 10 firms in a league table that the accountants, PricewaterhouseCoopers, draw up uh, every year. And what they do, they take the market value of all of these firms and they rank the firms and see who's up and see who's down. Uh, now, a, a glance down at this list of firms they'll almost all of them be pretty familiar with you. So Apple, I'm sure is familiar to everybody. Saudi Aramco, you might be less familiar with, that's the Saudi Arabian uh, oil and gas company. Microsoft, uh, anybody who's watching this will be using Microsoft e equipment. Uh, Amazon, you might just have done your shopping this morning. Alphabet, you might have searched for this uh, um, uh, um, uh, video on Google, Facebook, uh, and, and so on. Uh, tes Tesla uh, are in there um, as well. And the distinguishing feature of these firms, I think, 
can be thought about, and again, the, the, the heading of the slide, how the modern economy is changing. I think it's helpful to think about these firms by thinking about the assets which underlie these firms' success. Now, again, apologies to the non-economists when I say an asset. What I mean is the, 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 the sources of value, um, the capital that these firms have, uh, which are the, 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 the machines and so on and so forth, the sources of value that they own that provides them a, um, a, a flow of um, services that they use. Here is a picture of Saudi Aramco's assets. Right? It's not difficult to imagine and count what Saudi Aramco's assets are. They're the, uh, the, 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 the tubes and the oil rigs and the, and the tankers uh, and all of those kind of things. Here is a picture of Microsoft's assets. This is word one from 1986. This is the first few lines of the code. This is actually the uh, dictionary uh, code that looks up, uh, uh, that, that looks up um, uh, all, all the definitions of the various words. And you can see that it's a very different kind of asset to Saudi Aramco's asset. Uh, in the language uh, that we use uh, in the book, uh, what we say is Saudi Aramco's assets are tangible assets, assets that you can look, uh, that, you can, that you can touch and you can feel. Microsoft assets are intangible assets. They are knowledge assets. They're not something you can look or, look or feel. They are the embodiment somehow or other of ideas. What do we mean more exactly by that? The tangible assets that economists and accountants tend to count, which dominated previous uh, uh, in, industri periods of industri industrial development, are up there on the, on the screen for you. There are basically four of them, buildings, computers, plant machinery, and vehicles. Right? Anybody, if you've ever done any accounting, uh, you learn pretty uh, fast that that's what accountants like to, like to count. What we mean by intangible assets uh, are the kinds of things which underlie the economic fortunes of the companies I just mentioned, the Apples and the Googles and so forth. Let, let me just go through so, some of those here just to be clear. Uh, so one example of an intangible asset would be R&D. Uh, if we're talking about COVID, uh, the discovery of the COVID uh, vaccine or the various strains of the COVID, uh, COVID vaccines uh, would be an example of R&D. An intangible asset would be training, uh, again, a sort of knowledge, something you can't uh, uh, touch and feel, but it's something which is potentially very important for firms. The design of firms have, uh, the organizational development of firms. Uh, if you go and, uh, you know, go and buy a pair of shoes at Kmart in the US uh, and go and buy a pair of shoes at, uh, at Walmart in the US, uh, they both feel that they're, they're both pairs of shoes, but they're very different types of organization. Brands and marketing is a traditional form of intangible asset, um, which is obviously incredibly important for anything. Uh, all the, the, there are all the various brands in front of you, Nespresso, people like that. Um, artistic originals, uh, the development of films, books, TVs, movies, incredibly important for the British economy. Again, that would be an example of an intangible asset. And the final group of intangible assets uh, that we uh, look at is software and data. So obviously that's what's underneath uh, um, the Googles uh, and the Apples and so forth. Uh, to, to carry on that example a little bit, as well as Google and Apple and Microsoft have a lot of software and data, they of course have a brand and they have the marketing. Uh, and of course they've got organizational development. Amazon would be an example of a company with incredible software, but also with incredible organizational development uh, in order to get all the, all the stuff in such short order uh, from here to there. So those are the intangible investments. And our contention is that the economy has changed um, uh, at, with a big surge in those types of intangible uh, investments. Here's some data for the US, which shows you intangible investment over the, over the past sort of 50 odd years. And the red line tells you as a proportion of GDP, intangible investment used to be 8%, it's now 16%. The blue line tells you that tangible investment started at around 12% of GDP and has gone down to about 11%, so it's been fairly flat. So there's been a big shift towards the intangible investment, and that parallels the group of companies uh, that we've just seen. Our contention is uh, that the institutions that we've got uh, in our economy to do some of the things on the right, manage intellectual property, fund R&D, regulate competition, all that kind of thing, were developed in the era of tangible capital. Uh, and we need, therefore, as the title of the slide says, to do um, a bit of catching up.
Um, the host of problems then we don't feel have been addressed follow from the various properties <coughs> of the intangibles, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. So I'll just uh, flip by that. Um, now, uh, since the book is about institutions, I just want to spend a moment just forgetting about tangibles and intangibles for a moment and give you a sense of why it is that economists think that institutions matter uh, for um, uh, 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 for economic policy, number one, uh, and number two, how it is that institutions change uh, when technology has to change. So let me start with lighthouses. So here is Wynne Stanley's Edison Lighthouse uh, from the 1700s. Uh, it was an early lighthouse built, uh, I don't know if you can see the map on the bottom left there, off of the south coast um, uh, outside of um, Portsmouth there. Um, th it's a very treacherous area uh, for shipping uh, and the lighthouse was a um, important, uh, a very important uh, innovation. Um, uh, uh, but the, the feeling was <clears throat> by the mid 1860s, that the UK was behind in lighthouses. And indeed a Royal Commission uh, was, uh, uh, um, was constituted in order to investigate why it was that the UK was being so doing so badly in lighthouses. This is 1861. Since then, we've had many commissions trying to investigate why the UK is doing so badly. So this is an early example uh, of a technology problem. Just to give you some sense of it, uh, in 1861, the French were ahead of us. They had one lighthouse per 12 miles of shore. In the UK, we had one per 29 miles. The Americans, even the 1860s, were ahead of us. Uh, they had modern lenses. Uh, only just over half of the UK ones did. We used a sort of backwards technology. Sounds a very familiar kind of picture. Uh, and we uh, asked the question, or they asked the question uh, in the Royal Commission, why was the richest, most maritime country in 1861 lagging so badly? And our answer is uh, that the institutions didn't fit the technology. Let me explain uh, what I mean by that. Um, in the UK, lighthouses were mostly privately provided and they were privately provided, funded by uh, local harbour fees, which is to say when you floated into the harbour, uh, the lighthouse was just there and then you paid uh, a harbour fee for docking uh, your boat uh, and then that uh, funded the lighthouse. This, by the way, is exactly in contradiction to what you read in economics textbooks, which tell you that they're publicly provided. They weren't publicly provided. They were privately provided. Um, uh, in France, however, they were publicly provided. Now, the private provision in the UK, as it says on the slide, uh, is very helpful uh, to have a bit of experimentation, where to put the lighthouse, whether this harbour needs it, whether that harbour doesn't need it. You, you get away from the sort of central planning types of issues uh, and the rigidities uh, that might be, uh, uh, that, that markets might do a better job of explaining. However, what mattered was the invention of the Fresnel lens. Fresnel lens is the lens on the left-hand side. Uh, and I just need to explain this for a second because this is the example of the technology change. Before the invention of the Fresnel lens, Fresnel was a French inventor uh, in the 1850s. Before that, lighthouses had pretty poor illumination. They just regarded, they, they relied on burning oil um, or, or, or um, uh, uh, other, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, candles in, in, earlier, in earlier periods. Uh, and they cast very, very little light. What was brilliant about the Fresnel lens, which is a prism, uh, is it cast light, which lasted, uh, which which um, had a much larger range. So the early lighthouses could only cast light for a couple of miles and in bad weather, hardly at all. And that's in bad weather is when you need the lighthouse. The Fresnel lens cast light for 20, 30 miles. And what that meant was, as it says on the slide, once you had a Fresnel lens far off ships, would be able to benefit from the lighthouse, but the far off ships wouldn't come into the harbor. With poor quality light, the lighthouse was only a hard lighthouse. That's, that's the only range that it had. Uh, and that meant therefore that France's model, again, as it says on the slide there, of central direction made much more sense. What you needed is you needed some way of getting the far off ships to uh, charge a fee, uh, not just to the local harbour, but where they docked elsewhere in some other harbour. And then you would re remit it back to the harbours which they had passed, uh, and that would pay uh, for the lighthouse. So there's an example where the private provision of lighthouses in the UK was just the wrong institution uh, when there was a change in technology. Uh, so taking that sort of theme there uh, gives you the moral that these changes in technology uh, need new institutions. Um, 
to then understand what, what's going wrong with the institutions, we then need to understand why the intangible economy is different. What's the sort of change in technology, as it were, that comes about from an intangible economy? And again, I use technology um, in a way that, uh, the, the way the kind of economists use it, uh, in the kind of the property economy. Uh, the, the, why is that changed and why is that different? So let me say a word on that, uh, then I'll say a word about the different institutions um, and then I'll stop. Um, so here is an example uh, of the development of the intangible economy. On the left here, uh, there is a London taxi cab, obviously, um, and that is a very tangible thing. Right? Tangible invention, you can uh, look or feel it. Uh, in terms of the uh, categories early above, the accountants would count that under a vehicle. On the right is a slightly different taxi company. Uh, uh, this is Uber, uh, and they have an invention as well, but it's much more intangible invention, namely a piece of software which allows you to connect with the taxi. Uh, why then is an economy which consists of a lot of stuff on the left hand side very different to that looks which, uh, which exists on the right hand side? Um, let me go through some of these issues. Firstly about scale. If you want to scale up on the left hand tangible economy, you need another taxi. In other words, if you want to carry a passenger, you need another taxi. On the other hand, if Uber want to scale up, you don't need to write a whole load of software. They can just rely on the uh, same kind of software. So there are much more dramatic economies of scale in the intangible economy than there are in the tangible economy. A tendency, therefore, towards size and a winner-takes-all kind of style. Secondly, spillovers. So a spillover in economics is the following. If I go and travel from A to B in a taxi, I benefit from that uh, uh, from that from from that uh, uh, um, uh, traveling uh, from a to b uh, it, nobody else benefits from that on the other hand if somebody else looks at an uber uh, taxi algorithm and copies it then they do benefit from that so the point about an idea is unlike a tangible asset an idea the intangible asset can potentially be copied and used <clears throat> over and over again uh, so that's what economists call the potential for spillovers. Once you've th that kind of institution in the economies, uh, then you might have the uh, potential of lots of copying uh, going on. And that'll raise some economic issues, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, finally, on synergies, um, synergies is about whether the whole is the sum of the parts. Companies like Uber or maybe companies like Google, maybe companies like Apple, one of the things that we think they're incredibly good at is putting together all the various intangible assets. So the marrying together in Apple of the fantastic software plus the organizational capability to source uh, to source the phones and the computers uh, from China plus the branding, putting all that together gives you an absolutely world beating company. Uh, and adding these things together, as I say, the whole is going to be more than some of the parts is another sort of form of scale. So the move to the intangible economy, we think, has made these issues around scale and spillovers and synergies much more salient and much more important. Um, so let me say why is then that we need some institutional form to cope with an economy where scale and spillovers and synergies are more um, important. <clears throat> and to illustrate that, um, we go through a number of examples. Excuse me. We go through a number of examples in the book. Let me just give you one, uh, which is sort of two types um, of innovation. Uh, the Apollo program on the left-hand side uh, and the wheelie suitcase on the right-hand side. Um, so the Apollo program, uh, uh, much beloved uh, of many uh, uh, innovation, a case study much beloved of many innovation studies um, uh, uh, scholars, um, was of course a massive program with a absolutely extraordinarily ambitious uh, goal. Uh, and what did it require? It required, uh, well, what did it require? Um, it required a, a few things on the bottom left-hand side there. First of all, uh, it required enormous subsidies uh, to get a business to invest. No one private company would have done the Apollo probe by itself, needed supplies direction uh, from the government. Uh, it required an enormous quantity to be spent to deliver a big uh, complex goal required, goal required a lot of spending. Again, no one company would have done that. So it was best suited to central direction. 
And um, you might imagine that there might be some tremendous, or the hope might be that there might be some tremendous spillovers. So if you think about what the Apollo program was, it was a marrying together of rocketry technology, which would then those ideas, I talked about ideas spilling over before, those ideas would potentially spill over to the aviation sector with materials technology, because on re-entry, uh, the, the various modules, um, uh, service modules and so forth get very hot, so you need material science to help you with all of that. Those might spill over into anything domestic goods, so that's the Teflon uh, example. Uh, there was extraordinary communications technology, which, re which was required. Remember, the moon is 250,000 miles away. Uh, you need some pretty good communications technology uh, to reliably uh, allow you to keep in contact with all the astronauts. Um, and so you might imagine spillovers therefore uh, towards that. And then hanging over all of this is there wasn't much room. If you ever go and look at these rockets, what's extraordinary about them is where the astronauts sat was absolutely tiny. Since there wasn't much room, this needed a lot of miniaturization uh, and that led to microprocessing, uh, uh, microprocessor technology and the kind of integrated circuits which we now take for granted uh, in our computers. So there were potentially lots of spillovers from that big program. Now, let's go to the wheelie suitcase. The wheelie suitcase is the kind of polar opposite because it consists of a suitcase, as you see on the left there, uh, which is an old invention, with a, an even older invention called the wheel, uh, which you just stuck on the end of the suitcase. Indeed, it's always struck me as being extraordinary that it took until the 1970s for anybody to invent the wheelie, the, the wheelie suitcase. But anyway, there you are. Um, what did the wheelie suitcase require? It seems unlikely that you know a centralized group of the world's best physicists would invent the wheelie suitcase right what it needed instead is it needed this remarkable synergy combining the right ideas again the suitcase and the wheel um, and it was probably best suited to a market a free market which would encourage the discovery um, process rather than centralized direction so those two types of innovation one with a big emphasis on spillovers one with a big emphasis on synergies require potentially some rather different forms uh, of um, uh, uh, of institution. Perhaps spillovers on the left hand side require central centralized direction, uh, as in French lighthouses. Perhaps on the right hand side, um, we require more markets. Uh, and so we go through, uh, as I say, some of the institutional fixes that we need, that we think we need, uh, in the light of this, th this, these two different outcomes, which in some cases are in tension with each other. Just to give you a little bit of guidance about what the book says, we talk about public investment in research and knowledge. We talk about cities. Lots of these spillovers and ideas are probably going to occur in cities as um, people get the change between themselves. We talk about competition policy and we talk about financing um, as well. Um, so let's say something about immediately on funding science and technology uh, and education. Um, the notion of spillovers means firms are probably going to invest less in science than they should because uh, no one firm is going to be able to reap those, reap those benefits. Again, if you invent on the Apollo program some fantastic material, uh, heat resistant material, uh, which helps uh, re-entry into the atmosphere, um, uh, if somebody else copies that and makes Teflon frying pans, it's not clear that you can necessarily reap those kind of rewards. Um, so you might say, well, for science, what we need is we need very centralized direction uh, in order that those spillovers um, don't uh, get in the way of private investment. Um, the trouble is we think that if anything, um, a centralized funding has gone a bit too far. Um, the current science systems focus very much on quantity, not quality. There's a whole t tide of, uh, of measurement uh, in science, which which um, I, th I think many scientists and scholars feel get, gets in the way. Uh, and also, once you have a centralized system, uh, it's very open to cut the kind of influence activities as people spend time uh, attempting to get grants for their pet project. Um, we then had um, some suggestions over on the right hand side there in green, investing more money in research and development, having more experimental uh, uh, ways uh, of doing things. So bringing in some of the synergies in an attempt to get the, the, the wheelie suitcases and building what we call state capacity so that research funding and the patent agencies are better able uh, to make quick decisions uh, and help uh, uh, and help that not get in the way. Um, um, let me talk a little bit about financial architecture um, as well. One of the difficulties um, in terms, of, again, apologies for this rather busy slide. Um, let me focus on something called the curse of collateral. One of the difficulties is this. 
if you are Saudi Aramco and you go to a bank and you say, I'd like to borrow some money, the bank will offer you some security and you've got lots of tangible things you can give them as security. You can give them the buildings, you can give them the vehicle and so forth. Banks are perfectly satisfied in dealing with something like that. If, on the other hand, you are a firm who's just thought of a new idea for, I don't know, a new Harry Potter movie, uh, a software, uh, a new piece of software that would uh, make the Harry Potter movies even better, something like that, uh, banks often just don't know how to lend against that. That's a rather intangible asset, which is difficult to lend against. Uh, there is various workarounds there, which is that venture capital um, might help uh, lend against uh, uh, intangible assets, uh, but it's a very niche uh, area and venture capital has proved to be rather difficult to scale. Just to give you some sense of the difficulties on the right hand side here, um, here is the, on the top right, here is the share of bank lending to what we call the UK real economy. Uh, and the line to look at uh, basically is the blue line there on the very top. That's lending to financial corporates. In the 1980s, around 40% of bank lending was to financial corporates. Now that's about 15%. But again, in the 1980s, if you look at the bottom there, mortgages were around almost 50% of bank lending. They're now over 70%. So banks essentially um, have, have stopped lending to a very large extent. Uh, well, they're, 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 their lending has trended down towards corporates and it's gone much more towards mortgages. Mortgages are, of course, very tangible uh, lending uh, uh, to uh, um, to financial uh, to corporates nowadays is much more intangible. Um, I'll say a quick word about competition. People have talked about competition being a problem. Um, I talked about the uh, uh, the frontier firms breaking away from the other firms, uh, and uh, here's a graph of the concentration ratio. Uh, that's the dominance of eight firms uh, in uh, the various different industries, and you can see that that's gone up uh, with a feeling. Um, here's uh, pictures of Lena Khan and Maria Vestergaden. Um, here's the feeling that um, something has gone wrong with competition policy, uh, and these things uh, need a new influx of ideas. Um, we think rather not, actually. We think that's fundamentally what's going on is the changing competition is a function of tangibles. Here's the rise in concentration in the intangible intensive sectors. Uh, you can see that's been going up. In the low intangible sectors, uh, comp uh, concentration has hardly gone up um, at all. So those changes in concentration are a function of the change in the type of the economy rather than the competition regulators not doing the right thing. Um, so we had some uh, proposals uh, for competition regulators to look more um, at on with a kind of intangible lens. Um, uh, lastly, we had some ideas um, about cities as well, um, about re essentially relaxing, pl relaxing planning and relaxing zoning uh, and various ideas to give more power back to the people living in cities. Um, let me in that case um, stop there. Um, we've got some more suggestions in the book um, about um, financial policy uh, and financial architecture and so forth as well uh, around the role of uh, bank lending, as I mentioned before, but also lending by other institutions um, as well, as well as some other broader ideas um, around uh, um, uh, around other things, you know, such as trade uh, and Brexit and so forth as well. Um, but Jackie, if you don't mind, um, I will stop there um, and happy to take any thoughts or comments or questions. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. That was a very quick quiz around a very rich book. And um, for those of you who haven't read it, I would really recommend reading it. Or if you want, you can listen to it on Audible. And uh, if you want to buy it for Christmas, if you look in the chat, there's a discount from the publishers for those attending the seminar. The book is a really very, very rich uh, piece of work across a number of spectrums. But before we go into some of the topics I'd like to talk about, Joe Ellery, you've got a question here you just put in uh, the chat. Would you like to ask it yourself? Joe, shall I? Yeah, hi. Yeah, That's cool. Do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? And Jonathan, shall we take down the, or Emma, uh, Gemma, the slides so that we can actually see everybody? And everybody could uh, introduce themselves when they ask a question. Cool. Over to you, Joe. Yeah, hi. Th uh, thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Jonathan, as well. It's, I'm not really sure what the question is, so I'll, I'll start with that. But I was just minded to think that you were talking about synergies and how some of the big tech companies, um, as you rightly said, have kind of amazing synergies that um, mean that the different products and services um, work incredibly well together. And in fact, you kind of can't, you can't, you, they have, you have to use them together. I'm thinking of Apple um for example but 
those markets then have to be accessed via the, for example, operating systems, which kind of then regulate access to the market. So uh, again, as I said, maybe synergies isn't the right phrase here, but it's 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 that their products are so good, um, used by so many people, um, they can't really be challenged. Um, so yeah. I don't know any reflections you have on that. No, thank, thanks very much, Joe. Um, I, I, I think this is a tricky one, actually. If you, you know, if you went back to the early days of Netscape, Netscape was challenged by Internet Explorer, and then there was a long antitrust battle uh, against Microsoft to try to alleging that they'd done some terrible things. And whilst the over the years and years and years it took for that antitrust battle to be worked out. Chrome had meanwhile come along and then Firefox had meanwhile come along as well. So um, I, I, I think it's very difficult in tech to forecast uh, what will happen. What the economy I think more looks like, I had a little word on the slide there, and again, sorry for this sort of slightly weird economics-y notion is sort of punctuated equilibria, which is to say long periods of dominance, um, probably by some companies, but then uh, quick advance uh, to other companies as well. Um, so the reason I say all of this is that if you are a regulator attempting to you know, look at what companies are doing, I, I get that we want to stop companies from abusing their dominance. That's the key form of regulation. That's very important. But in order to do that, you need to take a bit of a bet on what you think the outcome of that competitive process is going to be. These companies themselves have no idea what the outcome of the competitive process is going to be. Uh, they don't know. I'm not sure the regulator knows uh, very well either. So in general, we are, I know this may be unpopular, we're rather cautious about too much intervention in these markets because we don't want to hand uh, unwittingly uh, incumbents an advantage uh, in such in a market which is so difficult to predict. Is it also maybe it's helpful to for other people you could just explain a little bit more of the concept of what you mean by synergies i mean your roly wheel uh, suitcase with one example you've got there and it's as far as i understand it um the synergies are really com combination of lots of different things that hadn't been put together before that's it, what the concept means do you, you say some more about it because these are kind of there's four key concepts in the previous book I think are very important in trying to understand what are the characteristics of the intangible sectors. Maybe Jonathan, do you want to just remind that in your own? Yeah, words? thanks, Jackie. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. So, so synergies is one, and and Joe, in your question, um, you know, you mentioned it's a company like Apple. Um, can put together, I think I mentioned it in, in the little talk, you know, the ability to write incredible software plus the, an, an intangible asset, the ability to source um, their materials, you know, across the world, another intangible asset, um, the ability to have the branding and the reputation, another intangible asset. The companies who can put those things successfully together are going to be very successful. And that's, Jackie, thanks for the prompt. That's what we call synergies. Um, and then the other ones I mentioned, spillovers, you can copy an idea. Um, if, if, if I have a vehicle transporting oil from one thing to another, you can't get a hold of that. But on the other hand, if I have a new idea for something, then you probably can get a hold of that. Um, and then the, um, uh, 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 then the scale, as I mentioned before, scale up with the taxi cab. There was another S, um, which I didn't mention, Jackie, maybe since you kindly gave me a little airtime, I mentioned this, which is something called economists called sunk costs. Often, if I am, well, we, we use the example of Nokia, um, who were an incredibly successful um, mobile phone company uh, until um, Apple uh, just knocked them, to, and BlackBerry actually knocked them to pieces. Um, Nokia, it turned out, once they went bankrupt, had two assets. One asset was they had a load of buildings uh, near Helsinki. Those are tangible assets. They were able to sell those straight away. Uh, but Nokia had um, the operating system, which it used on its phone. That was an intangible asset. That was some software, and nobody wanted any of that. So that had all completely gone away. Um, so that's, again, another one of the features that make it very difficult to lend money uh, against these kind of assets as well. Anyway, so it's those four kind of features of the intangible economy we think makes it look like a different economy and therefore requires the kind of institutional changes we've been saying. I think Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please so do. Do you think that 
but the, what you were saying, there's a much higher risk of intangible assets very quickly depreciating in value and almost, you know, to uh, very low. And, and what are the kind of consequences of that compared to maybe the more tangible assets? Yeah, um, yeah. so again, thanks for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, we, we do lots of surveys of firms with Office of National Statistics to find the service lives of these intangible assets. And uh, as the question suggests, they're actually quite, rather short. Typical service life for software, for example, is three years uh, in, in, in most, um, most accountants. A typical service life for a, a, a vehicle uh, would be 17 years. Um, so they, they, they last for a very short time. So they're something which firms have got to keep investing in and firms have got to keep renewing uh, in order, to, uh, in order to, to succeed. So yeah, firms always suffer the difficulty that their assets might depreciate um, very, very fast indeed. We've got a few questions coming in here. And one hmm. thing I just briefly say is a kind of bridge between them. I think if you're not familiar with the books, the first book, Capitalism Without Capital, is very useful. And when we invited Jonathan to talk in New York at the uh, Sarse conference back in 2019, I think the usefulness of that first book was really to try and develop concepts to try and understand what do we mean by the intangible assets and sectors and industries. And these four concepts came up as a way of describing particular distinctive characteristics about them. And I think the book was very important in that way of differentiating between what is what assets you can actually borrow against and which ones you can't, as you just illustrated. And I think the new book, what's interesting about it is looking at the consequences of those characteristics. For example, spillovers. How do you tax or get the rent from the extension of your ideas? It may have, so the whole issue is about patent protection. By the way, there's a great film on uh, Netflix, Billionaire Code, about you know the prototype of um, Google Earth and them suing Google Earth because they stole that prototype. But that was that's an example and an easy way to watch it of where the where the boundaries are. What institutions would tax the effect of people taking your ideas and putting them in a new way? Is that one of the ideas in the book? Essentially, from when I was reading it, these are the kind of challenges that institutions face. How do they deal with that? Is, would you like to say something about that? And then I'll go to the other questions that are coming up. Yeah, indeed. And, 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 and there are a number of challenges that we think a lot of intellectual property um, kind of law was essentially developed in the, well, perhaps, perhaps in the early intangible period. Um, a typical pharmaceutical uh, um, innovation is often a single patent or very few patents with a rather well-defined outcome, a formula for a drug, let's say. Uh, whereas in more modern patents, you know, around to the extent that they can be patented software, things like that, if you think of mobile phone, they've typically got hundreds of patents in them. So what really matters for them is the ability for companies to be able to pool all their patents together uh, strike deals with other companies to share all the different patents as well. That's the patents as well. So that requires a rather different approach to these uh, patenting and intellectual property uh, rules uh, than we've had before. Yeah, and I think your example, the lighthouse is really a really good, simple, clear example. How do you tax the people that benefit from the lighthouse that don't have to pay a harbour fee? That, that illustrated really clearly, essentially what a lot of the problems you're dealing with in the book. Okay, I've got lots of questions coming in. First, I'm gonna hand Amandi Shi uh, to ask her question briefly, and then I'll go to Maria Savona. So if the two of you would like to uh, come on screen and ask your question, and then I'll go to Ingo and to Richard Dickens. So uh, Amandi Shi, do you want to turn your camera on and ask your question and introduce yourself? If you're there. Oh yes, uh, sorry about that. I'm using the yeah. my uh, desktop, so there is no camera attached to no it. Problem. So yeah, I just want to. Oh yes, I'm the uh, lecturer uh, in the information system in the uh, Sussex Business School, and I want to ask for the uh, Professor Haskell regarding how uh, the, uh, how does he think about the uh, metaverse? Because uh, given the other uh, phone case, we know that the Apple, the Google, they are kind of like relying on those uh, intangible assets and uh, intangible uh, wisdom coming from all over the world to contribute to their assets, which is the Apple Store and Google Store. Well, for this uh, metaverse, there is no really land we say that how this metaverse is really landing to our real world, because it is not really 
useful in our like on a daily basis. So I'm just want, want to hear about our uh, ASCOS idea. What what is your opinion to to the metaverse? It's going to create uh, the next round of the uh, economic bubble. Jonathan, is it okay if I let Maria ask a question? Can you take two at a time? Sure, go ahead. Maria, would you like to turn your mic on and introduce yourself and what you'd like yes, to say? Sir. Hello, I'm, I'm Maria Savona. I'm a professor of economics of innovation in Spru and, and also Lewis in Rome. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks a lot for this. Good to see you again. And I'll buy the book and I'll see. Um, it'd be great to see uh, the development of capital without capitalists. So my question is, I've always been intrigued, as you might know, we had this discussion earlier about the huge heterogeneity in terms of what you call intangible assets as well. And it, I'm glad that you touched upon the institution side of this, because if we take, for example, two items of these intangible um, capitals, I mean, you have investment in R&D um, that typically have this, what you call the synergy effect, which is, in my view, is, is it's a negative externalities of firms investing in knowledge and not being able to fully appropriate when it's copied. Um, and the economics of patents have been, uh, you know, dealing with this uh, in terms of innovation policy for for a little time. I mean, you grant a patent to be able to maintain the incentives to invest in R and D, which is normally a bit risky and uncertain and and imitable, and therefore you protect uh, investors for this. However, patents also uh, are included in intangible assets. So that's something that um, it's a completely different item than, for example, um, uh, those items in the intangible that are related to labor markets like um, human capital and so on, which is a totally different um, issue here. And in fact, you mentioned Call My Agent, which I, which I watched completely. And this is something that uh, a long time ago was called highly intensive business services, knowledge intensive business services. Now, the question here in the intangible literature is trying to understand what is this knowledge in this particular case and what creates value for these particular jobs. Um, so I, I'm just, I guess, I guess my question is how, what is your common denominator that you would consider from the economic point of view across these intangible assets item that are so different and, um, and trying to understand how to deal with um, institutionally. So you mentioned competition policy and I think one of the main challenges also this, that how to redefine competition antitrust policy in the digital age uh, with, with large platforms and the tools in, the, in competition policy are completely uh, out of fashion in this. So. I'm looking forward to read your books because I, I'm, I'm hoping that all of these things are uh, touched upon, especially um, this issue on how to deal with value of items that are so heterogeneous and um, how to deal with the institutional policy side of dealing with such heterogeneous items that you consider intangibles. Sorry, it's a bit convoluted, but I, you know. No, it's fine. Oh, thank you, Jonathan, for doing those two before we move on to the next round. Thanks. Thanks very much for those questions. Uh, um, so dealing with Amanda first. So on the metaverse, um, I view the metaverse to the extent that I understand what metaverse is, the, uh, as a middle-aged man, um, I'm sure my kids understand it better than me. I, I view the metaverse as a sort of badge which deals with some of the issues that Maria was just talking about, namely some of the synergies, because presumably, you know, amongst, um, you know, Facebook and the associated companies, WhatsApp and all of that, there are tremendous synergies between the various uh, dimensions of the business which they're operating. So the fact that they can write software, which, you know, does the artificial um, intelligence for you to put the goggles on and all that kind of stuff, um, interacts with the fact that you can then tell your friends about it in, in Facebook uh, and WhatsApp them and, and so forth as well. So um, I, I, I don't know whether to your question, the metaverse will be the next bubble or not, um, but to the extent that uh, um, what, what the what uh, the company is doing is trying to put together uh, and combine all those different intangible assets, um, that would be my interpretation of it. Um, uh, and that leads to Maria's question. Thanks very much, um, uh, Maria, for the question. Um, so there are things on there. One is there's a tricky technical question in economics, 
which goes back to um, some of the what's called in economics the Cambridge con capital controversies about how you combine heterogeneous measures of capital together. Um, there's also a tricky question about how you can combine heterogeneous measures of labor together as well, actually. Um, uh, and we've got some suggestions in the book um, as to how you sort of do all of that. So that's a sort of rather technical answer. So I, I apologize for a technical answer, which probably won't be of that much interest um, to most of the people on the call. Um, the other way of saying it is to say, do we know the extent to which different assets, you know, are the right combinations? So is do we so we we know, for example, that many drug companies uh, spend. I think for every, I think the average is for every pound uh, or, or dollar or euro they spend on um, R and D, they spend three pounds, euros, dollars on marketing. Um, so there's clearly some kind of synergies there. Um, we also know from the COVID um, experience that what was required in order to cure drugs very quickly was not only the R&D to make the new drugs, but it was the organization of getting the new drugs into people's arms, which required some very difficult manufacturing processes and then required uh, you know, the organization of local health services to sort of deliver it all. So I think that there are just lots of examples, even within the relatively narrow field of pharmaceuticals, where these combinations of intangible assets just come up in all manner of very unpredictable ways. Um, so I think, for example, again, in the COVID, if you listen to Kate Bingham, uh, who was the British government's um, um, sort of chief person attempting to procure the drugs, she was mostly um, focused in the beginning on getting the scientists to get the formula right. Uh, but it then turned out that the manufacturing was unbelievably complicated. And so the, then they had to switch focus to the knowledge. So it wasn't just knowledge of the drug. They had to then switch focus to the knowledge of the manufacturing and then getting it uh, distributed and so forth um, was important as well. So I think those um, things all, all, all together in these are rather unpredictable ways. Thank you, that's very helpful. Can I just add, chip in I mean one of the things we found in the research center has also been whereas you looked at discrete sectors or companies and what they were doing what we're increasingly learning is the way organizations are morphing across many different activities and just really simply if you look at Tesco's for example is it a supermarket or is it a bank or is it an insurance company or a mobile phone company and I think what your question of heterogeneity is I think one of the strengths of these books is trying to find some quite complex but clear concepts that allow us to group particular sets of activities together that allow us to try and talk about this the problem in this book about institutional fit or lack of it and what needs to be done now so anyway let's move on to the uh, some more questions there's uh, Ingo has a question and Richard Dickens has a question so Ingo do you want to open up and ask very concisely what you'd like to say because we have about five minutes if we can maybe stay a little bit longer yes i know uh, richard dickens has actually left uh, he said so oh, I'll, I'll be concise regardless um, so thanks very much i'm a trade economist at sussex um and I, I was just wondering whether you know more could be said about the governance framework for competition going forward i, I should say thank you very much for a very nice presentation really I, i'm just not sure whether that uh, you know uh, prevention of abuse of dominant positions will really cut it going forward. And going back to that Saturn Apollo project that you rightly mentioned, um, you know, I, I just observed now, if you look at artificial intelligence, um, uh, where the funding for in that area went from nearly 100% public funding to now nearly 100% private funding, right? And all of this is completely yeah. under the control of maybe two or three private enterprises. Um, and if you know anyone who thought about algorithmic accountability knows it is going to be terribly difficult, right? Um, and I'm, I'm just not sure um, whether regulators will ever get a handle on just you know conduct, you know putting restrictions on conduct. Then again, in, in that sense, I don't really have a question because as an economist, I shy away from you know telling companies you know what they should be doing and where technical progress should be going because that. You know who, who knows best, um, but can we can we think more about how to tackle these issues of competition policy that you rightly hint at? Given that now all of the investment is in private hands, I'm sure Jonathan's got an answer for you. But I'm going to let Steve Rolf, if that's okay, ask the very last question uh, to make sure I include him as well. I know you've got lots to say on that topic, Steve. Would you like to introduce yourself for those who don't know Hi. you? 
Thanks very much, Steve Rolf, uh, a research fellow at, at Digit in Sussex. Um, thanks for a great talk, Jonathan. I just had um, a question really about the structural conditions which underpin the story you tell. Um, it seemed to me that you, you present the rise of intangibles as rather a sort of um, unavoidable trend that, that's, that's taking place. Um, but it, I, I was thinking, you know, when you were talking about two big structural trends, which in my view underpin some of these um, things that are going on. So first of all, we could look at things like the changes in capital markets that you touched upon uh, in the context of a, a sort of long term period of, of secular stagnation um, and the sort of um, the very dramatic entry of uh, uh, venture capital onto the scene, particularly since 2008 and its role in, in blowing up these big financial bubbles in, in intangible economies uh, at firms. So that's one thing. And then the second is the sort of geopolitical context of the story you tell. So I think um, at least one part of it seems to me that Western global northern multinationals could focus on um, intangibles precisely because other parts of the world could focus on the, the tangible stuff. So, you know, the archetypal picture here is uh, uh, Apple, you know, which offshores all of its manufacturing to, to Foxconn, which happens in, in, in China. Um, it seems to me that both of those big underlying structural conditions are, are kind of unraveling in different ways. I know you said you didn't want to talk about interest rates, but we're seeing big changes in capital markets at the moment. Um, and on the other hand, we're seeing also, you know, a, a coming uh, geopolitical rupture with China. So I, I wonder whether you see any sort of um, changes there which will affect your, your narrative. Thanks. Um, look, thanks for those two terrific questions. And with a very short time, I'm not going to do them justice. So just a few quick comments. Um, Ingo, on your thing about artificial intelligence, um, I would, th I, I do think that this intangibles, tangibles way is quite a good way of thinking about artificial intelligence in the following sense. If I think of the Google Cats project, namely it's something that three-year-olds can do, recognize a cat. We, Google have been trying to teach a computer how to recognize a cat. Uh, what do Google use? They use incredibly fast, soft, uh, incredibly f fast hardware, that's a tangible asset, running amazing software, that's an intangible asset, scanning all of these databases, that's another intangible asset along with software. It is again an example of the synergies between, in this case, the tangible assets and the intangible assets as well. Now, the Google people tell me that, and other people outside Google tell me that they've just got better hardware than everybody else. It's just better, uh, better than universities, better than anybody. Uh, whether that is amenable to public funding or not, or whether that leads to distortions or not, I, I do not know. Um, but I think this is a framework kind of thinking about those kind of issues. Um, it, it, uh, um, Stephen, um, thanks, thanks for your question. Again, um, I, can't, I can't do it justice. I'll just say uh, our view is that if anything, the intangible, the shift to intangible assets is actually being held back by some of the institutions that you mentioned. So one point about venture capital is that venture capital has proved to be <clears throat> extremely difficult to scale. Uh, it's very good for raising um, uh, money for ICT and software, but is much, much harder for raising money for things like green projects and climate projects and things like that, which are not software related. Um, so we urgently need to solve those kind of problems uh, uh, in the funding uh, if we're going to get uh, make some progress on the climate issues as well. But again, thinking about the different mixes of tangibles and intangibles, um, I find very helpful. Well, I'm afraid we're coming to the time when a lot of people are going to have to leave. Um, we've only haven't even began to discuss some of the really big arguments in Jonathan and uh, Stein's book about why the lack of institutional fit and what uh, type of institutional arrangements we need to come to to deal with some of these challenges. So who knows, maybe we'll maybe able to have another type of ses session later where we actually talk about the actual types of institutional change you're recommending and who the actors would be to actually bring that about. Jonathan, before I uh, mention what we're going to do next week, uh, do you have any last words you'd like to say? Um, not at all. I don't want to keep anybody, um, but many, many thanks for everybody tuning in. Re been really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody.